from the top rope, and the great American bash, I bid you all good evening morning afternoon, wherever you may be in this great land of ours or around the world. Welcome to the 50 millions dollar studio, I'm the pro wrestle machine. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to lace up your boots and step into the squared circle. Tonight, we're delving deep into the Wrestling Observer newsletter dated April 27, 1998, a time when the wrestling world was on fire with controversy and excitement. From the Monday Night Wars between the WWF and WCW to the Attitude Era's rise to prominence, this edition of the newsletter is a treasure trove of insider information and behind-the-scenes insights. Now, through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine, April 27, 1998 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Flair WCW issues continue. Spring Stampede Review. By Observer Staff. The situation involving Ric Flair and World Championship Wrestling continues to be the main topic of discussion, but what the situation exactly is between the two is another story. Here are the facts as best we can ascertain. Eric Bischoff, in a meeting with the wrestlers on April 13th before Nitro in Minneapolis, ran Flair down to an amazing degree calling him a swerve artist and a BS artist, talked about the no-show in Tallahassee a few days earlier, the plans for both a Four Horsemen revival and a Bischoff-slash-Flair angle that he claimed were thwarted by Flair's actions, and then claimed Flair was done with the company and that he'd make an example out of him, including a vow to sue him into bankruptcy. Flair has never received a termination notice from WCW, which theoretically would allow him to begin negotiations with the WWF, Flair has had no formal talks, as best we can ascertain, with the WWF, nor will he without a release due to the existing lawsuit between the two companies. Flair has made no bones about the fact to those close to him that he is interested in going to the WWF, particularly since WWF has no strong opponents for Steve Austin. Jim Ross mentioned Flair's name on the April 20th Raw show, probably to stir rumors that nowadays go crazy at things like this, that he would show up as a surprise guest, since its April 26th pay-per-view is from Greensboro and ensuing television tapings were from Hampton and Richmond, Virginia, although there is a 0% chance of that taking place, as it would result in a WCW lawsuit against WWF if Flair were to appear on camera. However, even under these circumstances, Ross wouldn't have made those remarks if the WWF believed that WCW was doing a secret angle involving Flair although as late as the middle of this week other WWF officials were very interested in the latest on the situation and the potential to use him both as a wrestler and also to do public appearances and ticket sale openings. World Championship Wrestling Incorporated filed a very real $2 million lawsuit against Flair in Fulton County, Georgia, Superior Court claiming a breach of contract by no showing Tallahassee and Minneapolis that played havoc with the script of the wildly popular productions. The suit charges Flair with missing the April 9th Thunder in Tallahassee, the April 13th Nitro in Minneapolis, the April 14th WCW Saturday Night taping in Mankato, Minnesota and the April 15th House Show in Duluth, Minnesota. It also claimed that Flair not showing up for the planned recreation of the Four Horsemen with Flair as the leader disrupted WCW's ability to introduce its planned storyline, causing significant loss of time, money and effort by WCW. What is interesting regarding that phrase is the knowledge that WCW really does little planning in advance and all ideas and angles are being constantly changed often until the very moment the wrestlers go through the curtain, which in many cases is almost the opposite of WWF with its long-term planning. At the pay-per-view on April 19th in Denver, Bischoff claimed he was going to tie Flair up legally from going to the WWF until his contract expires in 2001 and claimed Flair never told anyone in advance about his son being in a wrestling tournament. A $2 million breach of contract lawsuit over television no-shows that were all known about in advance seems pretty harsh, particularly with the track record of other wrestlers in the company including Kevin Nash no-showing Starcade with even less notice, but Bischoff did claim to people he was going to set an example. As mentioned many times previously, Flair never signed his three-year contract with WCW but did sign a legally binding document entering into negotiations with intent to sign which would pay him $725,000 this year, $725,000, in 1999, both with a 228-per-year maximum, and $500,000 in 2000. Bischoff as the week went on apparently believed Flair orchestrated all of what is happening because he believes Flair is trying to find a way to go to the WWF. There were people in the company who knew about Flair's son in the tournament, although what date they would have been aware of it isn't clear, but at least one person claimed he knew about it weeks ago and word was certainly out about it by the morning of April 7th. All the house shows scheduled with Flair vs. Kurt Hennig matches have been changed, depending upon the city to either Diamond Dallas Page vs. Hennig, 
which took place in Duluth this past week on a show flare was scheduled to headline, or to Giant vs. Hennig. As the week has gone on, more and more wrestlers within WCW are believing this is all a work citing, one, that the meeting Bischoff actually encouraged wrestlers to call two or three people they are normally strongly discouraged from talking with, myself and one other newsletter reporter, Wade Keller, being mentioned by name, about the contents of the meeting because he claimed he wanted his side of the story out, figuring that under normal circumstances he'd be buried for his decision to get rid of Flair. While that is all logical from his standpoint in that situation, it seems strange to the wrestlers that the names were used, too Arn Anderson was in the room when Bischoff was calling Flair a swerve artist, BS artist etc. and didn't react at all. Then again, taking the other approach, it wasn't Anderson's place in that situation to react and if he had reacted strongly at the boss burying his best friend in front of everyone if this isn't an angle, it probably wouldn't have been an intelligent reaction when it comes to his own long-term employment. Not only that, but if he had reacted in that situation, it would have looked even more like it was an angle. 3. A private contractual matter between a wrestler and Bischoff has never been anything he's made a big public deal about in the past to the wrestlers. Burying a wrestler as marketable and as legendary as flair to other wrestlers to the degree Bischoff did wouldn't make sense, as the reaction was strongly negative across the board to Bischoff to his diatribe. If it wasn't an angle, it would make it very difficult not only for Bischoff to take Flair back after telling everyone Flair was done, but for Flair to come back after his character was buried to that degree by the boss. So if it wasn't an angle, it would seem to be poor judgment by Bischoff and the belief is he's smarter than that. Of course this is wrestling and stranger things have happened. Bischoff making this move could have been a way to send a message to other wrestlers who it is known are looking at ways of trying to escape their contracts and it is possible that the lawsuit was filed as a work and could be quietly dropped in a few weeks, although those close to the situation that need to know within the company are very unhappy about the turn of events. And it could also be simply vindictive behavior, which one would think the guy heading a company that will gross nine figures this year would be above, but after the Sean Waltman situation, which clearly was a shoot, that somewhat similar situation is something that logically didn't make any sense. Ric Flair isn't just another wrestler like a Steve Regal or a Waltman who was let go without a big deal being made to the wrestlers about it, and Bischoff was generally viewed very negatively by the wrestlers for his handling of the Waltman situation and maybe felt the need to get his side of the story out to the wrestlers. Four wrestlers, being the environment they not only work in but also live in, tend to believe everything in life is a work to begin with. Some wrestlers still believe the Vince McMahon-Bret Hart deal was a work, even with a bulldog situation, subsequent legal threats and everything else making it obvious that it wasn't. It literally took years before most in wrestling believed UFC wasn't a work. No doubt many still believe it is, and some even think the NFL and NBA results are a work as well. That doesn't make them wrong about this specific instance just because their environment tends to make them overly paranoid about life being a work in other situations. There was no mention whatsoever made of flair on any of the television shows or at the pay-per-view this week. There were also directions given to the cameramen that while they didn't confiscate pro-flair banners, there were orders to shoot camera angles to not make any of them visible on television. If it is an angle, it appears to be done only for the wrestlers and a few inside fans which on the surface sounds really stupid, although in this environment, even as possible. And Bischoff is one of the architects along with Kevin Sullivan and Brian Pillman, of the Pillman Angle, in which Pillman proved to be the ultimate worker since as part of the work WCW actually legally wrote a letter firing him since Bischoff was even working the front office and legal department, which allowed Pillman to sign with the WWF. However, when Bischoff did the Pillman angle, he made sure it was played out in front of not only the wrestlers, but also strongly played it out in front of the television public, while the large majority of WCW fans have no idea what is going on with Flair, nor do they care since it isn't being addressed on the television show. In addition, the orders were reportedly given banning mentions of flair on the WCW website, which if this is an example of a changing environment where you shoot insider angles for the internet, would be the place if it was an angle that it would be pushed the hardest. Bischoff, and this definitely wasn't an angle, used similar legal threats to Eddie Guerrero and to others over the past few months back when Guerrero tried to get a release from his contract. On April 15th, a high-ranking WCW official who is friends with both Bischoff and Flair was in the middle attempting to work as an intermediary trying to save the relationship, and ended up making no headway. It is well known there has been long-term animosity between Flair and Bischoff, although nobody seems to be able to put their finger on exactly why. Flair has spoken with independent wrestling promoters who have contacted him and suggested to them that he expected to be available for public appearances in around 90 days but couldn't commit to anything right now and didn't know of when he would be available to wrestle matches. The reaction and behavior of all parties, except perhaps Bischoff, 
involves seeing closer to behavior of people involved in a legal problem, trying to keep everything quiet so as not to say something you'll later regret and try and avoid it getting publicity, as numerous media outlets since news of the lawsuit went public have tried to get comments from both sides unsuccessfully, as opposed to a pro-wrestling angle, making sure all the relevant information gets out as big as possible to create interest in the story. Hulk Hogan regained the WCW title from one-day champion Randy Savage due to outside help from Bret Hart and Bill Goldberg captured the US title from one-day champion Raven in a scenario that couldn't have been better if it had been scripted, well, I guess it was, to pace WCW on April 20th to victory as the ante in the Monday Night Ratings Wars was up to another notch. It was the two big title matches that made the difference as one again, the ratings showed the total wrestling audience, which set another record, switches back and forth between shows in larger numbers than ever before. And it's the flavor of the week that determines who wins. Last week's flavor of the week was the Vince McMahon and Steve Austin angle, but this week as they went to that well one more time, building the entire show around a tease confrontation between the two that drew a record audience last week. It came back one week later to lose in the same time slot by an amazing nearly three full ratings points. It was the same story last week, as on April 6th, WCW set an all-time audience record for a match in a competitive situation with the Sting vs. Kevin Nash WCW title match, and they built up a rematch on April 13th, which got killed by Austin and McMahon by nearly two points. The moral of the story is clear. What is hot this week is now passé by next week. The business has never been moving faster and it is the public by voting with their television clickers that is moving the angles at record speed. The company that stays with the pat hand for too long is going to play catch-up ball very quickly. Paced by the two title matches, Nitro drew a 5.11 rating, 5.18 first hour, 5.05 seconds hour, 5.10 third hour, and 8.35 share, its second highest rating in history and best rating ever in a competitive situation. Raw drew a 4.40 rating, 4.40 first hour, 4.40 seconds hour and 6.76 share, making it the fourth highest rated Raw episode in history and the third highest in a competitive situation. The combined head-to-head -head two hour audience blasted the record set two weeks earlier with a combined 9.48 rating and 14.82 share in 6,920,000 total homes. The other record set was the highest rated quarter hour in a competitive environment along with being the second most watched pro wrestling match in history on cable television as the finish of the Hogan-Savage match drew a 6.53 rating and 10.7 share in 4,774,000 homes, breaking last week's record set by the McMahon-Austin non-match of a 6.0 in 4,414,000 homes. It just barely trailed what was thought to be a nearly unapproachable mark, unless one company had the night to themselves, when WCW went unopposed on March 16th with Hogan and Savage vs. Sting and Luger doing a 6.6 .6 rating in 4,840,000 homes the most watched wrestling match ever on cable. The Nitro replay also did a 1.6 rating and 7.1 share. But this week's flavor is last week's nostalgia in 7 days. Raw should be expected to destroy all its records on April 27th and continue with ratings in the low fives through May 18th since it will be going unopposed with TNT carrying two NBA playoff games. At press time WCW officials weren't even certain of when or what form Nitro would take as it wasn't until Sunday when the NBA released its playoff schedule did it become official TNT would be broadcasting two games, thus leaving no time for wrestling. The plan was expected to be, but still not definite, that Nitro taped on April 27th in Norfolk would air on April 28th, although whether it would be two hours or three hours and what the starting time would be wasn't finalized. Nitro also firmly established the obvious, that Goldberg is a big money player, Although Goldberg had received the biggest pops nearly every night for weeks, his matches had to this point resulted in no significant ratings change although his amazing merchandise sales which just began one week ago was already proof. Being heavily pushed in his first major match of his career against Raven resulted in WCW maintaining almost its entire first hour audience, as the match in what is traditionally the death spot for WCW, drew a 5.7 rating against a 3.7 rating for Vince McMahon and the Love Shack. To show the interest level the Goldberg match drew, when it was over, WCW fell from the 5.7 down to a 4.6 for Ultimo Dragon vs. La Parca and Chris Benoit vs. Kurt Hennig, while at the same time WWF drew from 3.7 to 4.5 largely for DX in the ring spraying the super soaker on the crowd. It is already pretty clear that perhaps the biggest rating, and maybe even the biggest buy rate, 
that WCW would do in the near future is to get Goldberg to a 99-0 record and go for number 100 against Hogan. If you take away the two monster matches, Raw actually held a 4.72 to 4.66 lead with the next five quarters being 5.0 for Nitro Piper interview Hammer vs. Saturn, to 4.5, End of DX vs. LOD and Own interview, Severn vs. Mosh. Undertaker choking Kevin Kelly, 4.9 for Nitro, beginning of Public Enemy vs. Steiner and Bagwell, to 4.9 Bradshaw vs. Goldust, 4.5 for Nitro, end of PE vs. Steiner and Bagwell, Booker T vs. Psychosis, to 4.8, Austin Interview, Midnight vs. Funk and Scorpio, and 4.3 for Nitro, Luger vs. Adams, to 4.9 for Raw, Sable Interview, McMahon Interview, beginning of DX vs. LOD and Owen. At that point the Hogan Savage match took place with WCW going up to a 5.1 for the intros and early part of the bout while WWF fell to a 4.3 for the six-man, and the final quarter saw Nitro with the title match finished due a 6.5 to Raw's 3.6 for Blackman vs. Dude and the next Austin MC Mahan angle. But the reality is, despite a solid win for WCW after several close weeks, this ratings battle is every bit the dogfight it has looked to be for the past month. Strategically, it appears the best format for WCW is to have a strong main event match start at about 8.55 p.m. to maintain its unopposed first hour, while continually building to a big main event in the final quarter. The 10.1 final quarter and 16.8 share totaling 7,445,000 homes for the two shows fell just shy of the 10.3 record set in the final quarter hour the previous week. It also should be noted that going unopposed, the Chris Jericho vs. Juventud Guerrero match in the first hour did a 5.8 rating and 9.6 share. The WCW Spring Stampede on April 19 from the Denver Coliseum looked to be one of those shows that on paper was going to be a waste of time. After all, WCW had been presenting bad television for several weeks, and while a few of the undercard matches looked to have decent potential, none looked any better than normal Nitro Fair and the main events looked positively atrocious. Well, you never know, and this was an example of that. Not only was it a very good show, but for the first time since September, WCW actually ended a show with a decent match. Even working with a torn anterior cruciate ligament, Randy Savage carried Sting to his best pay-per-view match in recent memory, capturing the WCW title before a sellout of 10,428 paying $235,251 and another $90,073 in merchandise. The show featured two of the three best pay-per-view matches thus far this year, a great brawl between Diamond Dallas Page and Raven where Raven captured the US title, and a surprisingly great wrestling match with Ultimo Dragon, the smoothest wrestler on the planet, and the rapidly improving and hilarious straight man, Chavo Guerrero Jr. Even the Hulk Hogan and Kevin Nash vs. Roddy Piper and the Giant Bat match, which figured on paper to be horrible, wasn't that bad and at least told a story. The only real negative to the show was an over-reliance on referee bump and outside interference finishes, and why is it not a surprise that Dusty Rhodes is now working in the office helping with finishes? Including all three top matches and six of ten matches in all. 1. Bill Goldberg pinned Perry Saturn, Perry Sotelo, in 8-10. This match had the most heat of any match on the card even though there were situations where if it had been anyone but Goldberg in there getting lost, the crowd would have died. Early in the match Goldberg pressed Kidman and threw him over the top rope onto Saturn. The length of the match exposed Goldberg's lack of experience at selling and making a match, but he can get away with it. Saturn did a real good job of carrying him for the most part, although some of his stuff was sloppy. At one point he tried a springboard move off the ropes and slipped and fell backwards to the floor. After coming off the top with a spin kick, Saturn put on an arm breaker, but Goldberg broke it. At about 5.30 in the match fell apart momentarily but Goldberg then hit his tackle and went for the jackhammer, but Saturn broke it using a low blow while Kidman distracted the ref. They tried what would have been an awesome spot with Goldberg press slamming Saturn, while standing on the middle rope, but he couldn't get Saturn up and just dropped him. Goldberg tackled Kidman but was attacked by Saturn who got him in the rings of Saturn. Goldberg broke the rings but powering to his feet and hitting the jackhammer, although the sequence reads a lot better than it looked, but still got the super pop. 1 and 1 half star. 2. Ultimo Dragon, Yoshihiro Asai, pinned Chavo Guerrero Jr., Salvador Guerrero 3, in 1149. Dragon was incredible and Guerrero stayed right with him. The stips here were that if Guerrero won, then he didn't have to listen to everything Eddie says, but if he lost, Eddie would ride him twice as hard. 
When Chavo was on the defensive, Eddie put a towel over his head as if he was embarrassed to be seen. All kinds of fast spots and reversals and the execution and timing was flawless. Dragon did his Osai moonsault. Guerrero did an incredible twisting corkscrew dive over the top rope which actually overshot Dragon a bit. The climax spot saw Dragon come off the top rope when Guerrero dropkicked him to meet him, but caught him low. As Dragon was selling the low blow, Guerrero refused to attack him until he recovered from the foul. Eddie was going crazy about this and slapped Chavo twice. After Dragon recovered and traded near falls, Dragon with an inside cradle and Chavo with a brain buster. Chavo went for his tornado DDT finisher, I know he never wins, but if he was going to that would be his finisher. But Dragon blocked the completion and turned it into a Dragon sleeper for the tap out finish. After the match Chavo told Eddie that he refused to cheat to win. 4 stars. 3. Booker T. Booker Huffman retained the WCW TV title pinning Chris Benoit in 1411. Very stiff hard fought match. Toward the finish, Benoit hit a diving headbutt more than halfway across the ring and followed with three rolling German suplexes for a near fall. T came back with a sidewalk slam hard and a flying forearm. T went for an axe kick, but Benoit put referee Mickey J in the way, and he got nailed. Benoit put on the crossface, but there was no referee. T tapped the mat twice but it was an ambiguous tap as you couldn't tell if he was actually hitting the mat as he struggled to the ropes. Finally T reached the ropes and Benoit broke it. Benoit tried to get Jay back together, and this gave T recovery time and he went for a Harlem side kick which looked more on target for Jay, but Jay ducked it and it hit Benoit, who was then pinned. 3 and 1 half stars. 4. Kurt Hennig pinned Davy Boy Smith in 448. In an unannounced stipulation, Rick Root was handcuffed to Jim Neidhart. After the two previous great matches, not only was this time for a bathroom break, but time to leave your brain in another room. Now they're trying to explain the unexplainable. You see, the reason Rude has handcuffs every week and after the angle is over, Doug Dillinger always has the keys because all handcuffs have the same master key. Okay, granted, Dillinger should always carry a handcuff master key because God knows what things these guys are doing on the road with handcuffs and what sort of emergencies might crop it, that much is understandable. But given all that, and because it happens to Smith and Neidhart every week, why don't they carry one of these secret master keys with them as well? At least thinking like that distracts you from having to wait until this match is over. Henning had a big brace on his right knee. Neidhart began choking a uniformed police officer, who looked like the police officer who hooked Neidhart and Rude together, you know, all blacks look alike, and the second one turned out to be Vincent. Vincent gave Rude the key to the handcuff while being choked, how Virgil had it was another of those inexplicable deals but I guess the police and the NWR are working together with the evil spells cast by the WWF to destroy the former Hart Foundation which may also explain why Nash can get arrested 45 times but still never wind up with a criminal record. Rude unhooked himself, and hooked Neidhart up to the ring post. Well, you can figure what happened there. He interfered and Smith was pinned. And then Rude and Hennig destroyed Smith and Neidhart including Rude choking both, with Vincent's night stick. Eventually one of the refs came out, the WCW referees are in on the conspiracy as well, with yet another master key and unlocked Neidhart. Bobby Heenan was hilarious through all this making jokes about just leaving Neidhart there all day hooked to the post and Klondike, former wrestler Klondike Bill who works on the WCW ring crew, could just set them both up tomorrow in the next city. Dud. 5. Chris Jericho, Chris Irvine, retained the WCW Cruiserweight title beating Prince Aokia, Mike Hayner, in 9.55. Aokia was working the match with a sprained right knee. Fans saw this as the popcorn match and didn't care at all, but Jericho did such a good job that they were really into the match by just a few minutes in. Jericho did a great job here in selling that he was about to lose and has really made the belt mean something, well, as much as it can mean since it's not like the top guys ever challenged for it, including doing near falls where he kicked out so late everyone thought they were the finish. Jericho turned a Rana into a lion tamer but Aokia made the ropes. Aokia got a great near fall. At another point both were standing on the top rope and tumbled to the floor, which was a planned spot reminiscent of a screwed up spot in a Jericho vs. El Samurai match last year in New Japan. All kinds of reversals by Aokia into hot near falls before Aokia hit his Northern Lights suplex finisher but Jericho made the ropes. Jericho on his third attempt at a lion tamer, got it in the middle for a submission. Three and a quarter stars. Six. Rick Steiner, Robert Reich Steiner, and Lex Luger, Larry Fold, beat Scott Steiner, Scott Reich Steiner, and Marcus Bagwell in 558. Bagwell came out with the most pathetic-looking rap job of a cast saying that he couldn't wrestle. 
J.J. Dillon came out with a doctor who examined Bagwell and said he was hit to wrestle. Most of the match saw Rick beaten on until he hot tagged out. After Luger spent a few seconds in, he tagged a fresh Rick who clotheslined Bagwell and then chased Scott to the back. Scott's arms are freakish. I know they've always been but for some reason they're looking more freakish than ever and he tore his bicep right off his arm a few years back. As someone mentioned to me someone needs to get Scott to read Jeep Swenson's autobiography. Bagwell was on the top rope ready to do his buff blockbuster, but Rick ran back and shoved him off. Luger then racked him for the win. One and one quarter stars. Seven. Psychosis, Dionisio Castellanos, Pin La Parca, Valfo Tapia, in 659. These guys had no chance late in the show doing an unadvertised match while fans were waiting for the main events. Psychosis was incredible, with a crazy hurricane rana off the top, a running dive over the head and a twisting moonsault off the top rope to the floor. Parka did a split-legged moonsault outside of the ring. At one point Parka tried a power bomb, but Sikosis turned it into a hurricane rana for a near fall. Geez, what was Parka thinking doing a power bomb and thank God for Sikosis reversing it? On his salary, he can't afford the fine and with his immigration status committing a felony could be grounds for deportation. And I'd hate to think how he'd get over in prison wearing that outfit. They might try to unmask him and then he'd have to return to Mexico and create some story about how the dirty Americans double-crossed him and stole his mask. Anyway, while Parka was having acid flashbacks to childhood seeing the movie version of Midnight Express while he thought about doing that power bomb, Psychosis was still thinking about wrestling and nailed him with a guillotine leg drop for the pin. Two and a half stars. 8. Hulk Hogan, Terry Balia, and Kevin Nash beat Roddy Piper, Roderick Toombs, and the giant, Paul White, in 1323 of a baseball bat on a pole match. A lot better than it looked on paper. Hogan whipped Piper and then Piper whipped Nash with a belt. Nash tagged in with Giant and they did a simultaneous high kick spot with both taking a bump. Piper began slugging it out with Hogan and did one of the worst looking lariats of this generation. Giant dropped Nash out of the ring while Piper put Hogan at the sleeper but Hogan made the ropes. At this point Giant shoved Piper up the pole and he got the bat, before he could get all the way down Giant was thrown off the ropes, Hogan got the bat and then threw it to the floor, if you're asking why he did it it's because he needed to a spot for Ed Leslie to shine. As Hogan and Nash who worked together cohesively the entire match, were beating on Piper, Leslie showed up with a new bat and gave it to Hogan who KO'd Giant with it. Nash held Piper and Hogan went to hit Piper, who moved and Nash got nailed. Piper got the bat and hit Nash and threatened Hogan. At this point Leslie grabbed the bat and distracted Piper, and threw another bat to Hogan, who used it on Piper for the pin. After the match Hogan told Nash to powerbomb Giant, and as he bent over to do it, Hogan hit Nash with the bat. Giant got up and cracked the bat over his knee and Nash headed out as well. One and one half star. 9. Raven Scott Levy, won the US title from Diamond Dallas Page, Page Falkenberg, in 1152. A wild brawl all over the place with tons of interference. Basic using every shortcut in world match, Page used a pescado on Raven and Sick Boy in the open and whipped Sick Boy into the guardrail. They ended in the back where a stagecoach setup was put together. Raven was whipped through the wooden gates and at one point Page jumped off the top of a stagecoach with a double sledge on Raven, who was hanging out in the hay. Raven went through a few more fences, took some hard garbage can shots. They tore up the set. Page suplexed Raven on a table. Raven kicked Page through a backdrop, and broke what appeared to be a glass pan over his head and splashed him off the stands onto a table that didn't break. Raven used a bull rope to choke Page and hit him with a cowbell and used another garbage can shot to the back. Sick Boy came out with a kitchen sink and nailed Page with it but Page kicked out of the pin. Page used a drop toe hold with Raven crashing on the sink, and then Kidman went off the top rope and when Page moved, hit Raven, but Raven kicked out of the near fall. Sick Boy hit Page with Lodi's crutch but Page kicked out. Page used an inside cradle for a near fall. Hammer came off the top rope and accidentally clotheslined Raven, and Page hit Hammer with the sink and got another near fall on Raven. Raven came back with a low blow. Finally Lodi threw in the dreaded stop sign but Page got it from Raven and hit Hammer and race with it and then used a diamond cutter on Kidman who tried to interfere. At this point Hulk Hogan nephew Mike Balia, Horace Boulder, came out dressed as a stage hand and clocked Page with the stop sign and Raven DDT'd Page onto the sink for the pin. 4 stars. 10. Randy Savage, Randy Poffo, captured the WCW title from Sting, Steve Borden in 1008. They brawled to the back early where Sting threw Savage into another wood fence and dropped his throat on the wood. 
Sting hit Savage with the dreaded bale of hay, that the poor announcers had to sell as something vicious. Next thing you know they'll be pointing out that the gooey substance in the marshmallows the guys are throwing at each other from a campfire setup are actually potentially crippling. Back near the ring, Sting missed a stinger splash into the ring post. Savage took two nasty bumps over the top rope landing on his feet to break the fall, which must have done wonders for his bad knee. Sting suplexed Savage on the floor. Back in the ring, Sting went for a stinger splash but hit ref Charles Robinson. Savage hit a pile driver but Sting popped up. Elizabeth went to hit Sting with a chair but he no-sold that spot. As Sting hesitated showing sympathy for Elizabeth, Savage nailed him from behind with a chair shot. Savage then got to the top rope for his finisher, but Hogan and Leslie showed up and Hogan shoved Savage off the ropes. Savage tried to spin to avoid destroying his knee on the fall and it may not have worked. At this point Elizabeth was carried off, which may be the ado for her wrestling career as she was married in December and with Savage being out due to knee surgery, figured that would be it for her and apparently she, who is now 37, wanted to start living a real life, you know, life apart from the boob jobs and starvation diets which are what too many women in this profession are strongly encouraged to live their lives going through to keep their figures at an age when doing such becomes going against nature. Savage was limping badly by this point and Sting used the scorpion death drop on him. At this point Nash showed up and powerbombed Sting and put Savage on top for the pin. As the show was ending, Hogan and Leslie, who had left after thinking they had given Sting the win, came out and were furious about Savage winning the title. They ended up jumping Savage and Nash after the show went off the air with Hogan trying to take the title belt, until the rest of the NWO did a run-in and Scott Norton took the title belt from Hogan saying, it was in the NWO family. Two and a half stars. Just when it seemed things couldn't get worse for the Ultimate Fighting Championships when it came to its position on pay-per-view, they did. The recent merger of Request Television and Viewer's Choice, technically TCI switching all its systems to Viewer's Choice which puts Request out of business within the next six weeks and gives VC the basic monopoly on carrying pay-per-view channels in the United States should have been a positive for UFC. It was Request that had dropped carrying the events while Viewer's Choice had continued to do so. However, Viewer's Choice just informed Semaphore Entertainment Group that the July 14th UFC would be moved from its main channel, Viewer's Choice 1, to its secondary pay-per-view channel, Hot Choice, thereby costing UFC several million potential homes. The claim was the move was because with all the changes, the largest MSOs in the new Viewer's Choice system would be Time Warner and soon to be TCI, which had already made a corporate decision not to carry UFC in the wake of the New York Times negative articles last year and subsequent New York state law banning the events live in New York, the state Time Warner is strongest in. BC didn't want its primary channel to go blank in its two largest cable MSOs, combined with less than spectacular buy rates of the previous two shows, so instead moved the event to a secondary channel, which is believed to only be available in 7 to 8 million homes nationwide and that combined with satellite homes would cut the current UFC universe of 15 to 17 million potential homes down to 10 to 12 million. UFC was struggling to make ends meet on the 15 to 17 million universe, and cutting the revenue back another 33% or so has to be labeled as disastrous. David Isaacs, who heads the UFC for Semaphore Entertainment Group said at this point with the universe cut down that it isn't looking feasible unless the numbers change to do a live show. There is very serious discussion of making the July show into a tape show built around a Frank Shamrock title match in May with the show built as something along the lines of greatest championship fights in UFC history with famous matches with Hoist Gracie, Ken Shamrock, Dan Severn, Don Fry and the rest and perhaps if things break in UFC's favor trying another live pay-per-view in September. Presenting a highlight show with one or two new matches taped earlier would certainly not be seen by fans looking in from the outside as a positive sign for the UFC long term, and this latest blow is already being seen by many within pay-per-view as the potential final mortal blow. There apparently has been some consideration given to attempting to run closed-circuit locations for UFC due to the unavailability of the show in much of the country on pay-per-view and the May 15th show is going to be test-marketed in a 1,300-seat theater on Long Island. Realistically, the odds are strongly against any event short of a major boxing match with Oscar de la Hoya or Mike Tyson being able to make a go of it in 1998 on closed-circuit and UFC is nowhere near that league. Isaac said that nationwide closed circuit isn't being considered but they are considering doing some limited shows in a few markets that don't get the pay-per-view that had traditionally done strong buy rates in the past. The WWF gave up closed circuit of WrestleMania back in 1988, since after being exposed to pay-per-view, fans were no longer willing to go back in time. The next UFC, scheduled for May 15th in Mobile, Alabama, is also in disarray. 
The last scheduled main event of Mark Coleman vs. Tsuyoshi Kosaka is also up in the air at press time as Rings officially sent word that Kosaka was suffering from dizzy spells and was questionable for the match. It was interesting because initially Akira Maeda stated to the Japanese press more than one week ago that Kosaka wouldn't be able to do the UFC because Rings had a major show on May 29th in Sapporo. Kirk Jensen, the manager of Maurice Smith, who was instrumental in getting Kosaka into UFC, was going to Japan this week to either get a final word on whether Kosaka would do the show. At the April 16th Rings show in Osaka, they made an announcement at the show that Kosaka would be competing on the May 15th UFC against Vitor Belfort, since word at that point hadn't reached Rings about the planned change in the card. Since that time Rings has received word about Kosaka being slated to fight Coleman, and then came the injury report. The semi-final match is still up in the air at press time although John Peretti is attempting to put together a match with Regan Machado of the famed Machado family, a Brazilian family which as legend has it is as good as the Gracies as Regan Machado in some circles is reputed to be another Hicks and Gracie but a true heavyweight at 230 pounds. But they would never fight in NHB competition against Mike Van Arsdale, a world-class Greco-Roman wrestler who is 3-0 in NHB via winning an eight-man tournament recently in Brazil. The match was described to be as being in serious negotiations to happen. Vitor Belfort at press time appears to be off the show due to the two sides not coming to financial terms, although with Kosaka out no doubt Belfort would have to be at least considered as a potential opponent for Coleman. At one point over the past week there was strong consideration given for a Belfort vs. Coleman main event, although the two are planning on becoming training partners which makes that match more difficult to put together. In addition, they are probably going to add a middleweight title match involving Frank Shamrock to the live show, which would be taped and used as the main event for the July pay-per-view. Mitsuharu Misawa, complete with a banged-up knee, back, neck and broken finger, captured all Japan's champion carnival tournament beating Jun Akiyama on April 18 at Tokyo Budokan Hall before an announced sellout of 16,300 fans. It was Misawa's second carnival championship, having won previously in 1995. With Misawa also holding the Triple Crown the win and story of winning with all the injuries seems to set Misawa up for dropping the title to Toshiaki Kawada on the May 1st Tokyo Dome show. Akiyama spent the match working Misawa's bad left knee, the kneecap of which was broken on April 6th. He worked the left knee early, setting up for using a scorpion deathlock at around the 10 minutes mark and later a figure 4 leglock, both times with Misawa escaping to the ropes. Misawa came back with a missile drop kick and twice used a facelock submission and got a near fall with a tiger driver before Akiyama went back to working the knee. Akiyama got two count after two count on Misawa using moves such a bulldog headlock, a tiger driver, a Misawa style spinning elbow, a German suplex and his own exploder suplex. Misawa came back getting near falls with two German suplexes of his own, before Akiyama hit a Hashimoto style jumping DDT for a real hot near fall, and Misawa kicked out of yet another exploder. Misawa then made the comeback with three hard elbows, a rolling kick and another elbow to score the pin at 22.05. The storyline going into the match was that Akiyama, who went to a 30 minutes draw with Misawa in their March 27th carnival match, if he had won, would be the youngest wrestler in history to ever win a carnival tournament, he's 28, Jumbo Tsurida when he won in 1980 was 29. Nevertheless, it turned out logical as Misawa looks to be totally dominant beating nearly everyone in the carnival while being far from 100% leading up to his doing the big job to Kawada, while Akiyama was never expected to get nearly this far in the first place so losing in the finals is still a big step up for him. Going into the final show of the round robin on April 16th in Koyama, Misawa was in first place having finished all his matches beating Wolf Hockfield on April 15th, with an 8-1-3 and record for 19 points, 2 points for a win, 1 for a draw. The key matches in Koyama pit Akiyama, 8-1 and 2, 18 points, against Steve Williams, 8-3 and 0, 16 points, and Kenta Kobashi, 7-2 and 2, 16 points in his grudge match against Stan Hansen, 8-2 and 1, 17 points, stemming from the angle in the tag match where Hansen turned on him. Akiyama ended up going to a 30-minute draw with Williams, which was all he needed to clinch a spot in the finals. This left Kobashi versus Hansen and if Hansen won, he'd made the finals into a triangle match, but any other finish would wind it up with Misawa versus Akiyama. As it turned out, Kobashi pinned Hansen in 1932 with a lariat. Both Kobashi and Toshiaki Kauda finished Carnival with an 8-2 and 2 record, tying for third place with 18 points. Hansen 8-3 and 1, Williams 8-3 and 1, tied for fifth with 17 points. From there, it was Johnny Ace 5-5 and 2, and Gary Albright 6-6 and 0, 
tying for 7th place with 12 points, Akira Tawue in 9th spot with 4-8-0, with 8 points, Takao Mori in 10th place with 3-9-0, 6 points, Wolf Hockfield to 10-0, and, and Giant Kimala to 2 10 and 0, tying for 11th place with 4 points and June Izumaida, 0 12 and 0 in 13th place with 0 points. In recent weeks, the injury situation within pro wrestling has grown at probably an even greater rate than its popularity. Besides Misawa, among the other ongoing injuries have included Randy Savage, torn knee ligaments, apparently worsened in the pay-per-view match against Sting, and was expected to undergo reconstructive surgery on his right knee on April 27, and expected out of the ring anywhere from three to six months. Shane Douglas, Douglas nearly passed out from pain while driving his car to the airport on April 18 for the ECW Arena show that he was scheduled to headline in a title defense against Sabu. The injury is believed to have been a broken palate, a broken bone in the roof of his mouth, which he believes took place while eating a punch in a match a few weeks back in Rochester, New York. He was expected to see a neurosurgeon this week for another opinion. There was a possibility that surgery to correct this problem would be necessary this week. This is in addition to his elbow injury that will require a second operation in early May. Douglas will definitely not be in the ring not even making any live appearances for ECW until the pay-per-view show on May 3rd, and after the show he's going to be out of action for a long time. Similar to Savage this past weekend and Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania, Douglas is expected to show up at the pay-per-view and do whatever he physically can in the match with Al Snow. Taz, to make matters worse, when ECW found out on the last day that its much-hyped arena main event was going to change, the plan was to change the match to Sabu vs. Taz. However, in an interview early in the show, Taz did an angle where he was supposed to suplex ref P. We more over the top rope and threw a table to set up the Taz match later in the show. The angle got screwed up as a few spots went wrong, and impromptu, Taz attempted to either do a knee drop of a leg drop on Moore through a table which had yet to break. In doing so, the leg of the table literally ripped all the flesh and muscle away from his shin bone and he was rushed to the hospital where he needed 18 stitches and may need further surgery. The leg was described as looking like a shark bite. Taz is expected to be out of action for at least one month and is definitely off the pay-per-view on May 3rd. Keiji Muto, as it turns out, Muto had operations on both his right and left knee on April 13 after the pounding both knees have taken over a 14-year career from the man who brought the move and term moonsault to worldwide popularity. The belief is it was the constant pounding of the knees landing when doing the move that have resulted in Muto having chronic knee problems since 1989 and it is expected when he returns in late summer that he, like Kenna Kobashi before him, will have to retire that move as a nightly prelude to the finish. Ken Shamrock, out of action with a sprained ankle and either strained or torn ligaments in the ankle suffered while doing a pull-apart brawl on the April 13 Raw show from Philadelphia. Shamrock was out of action this week and is expected to return at the pay-per-view show on April 26, although that was pending a doctor's examination to the actual extent of the ankle damage. Sable on April 16 at a house show in Hershey, Pennsylvania when doing the cat fight spot with Luna, Sable's foot was accidentally stepped on by ref Tim White and her toe was broken in three places and missed the rest of the weekend shows. WWF was saying that they were expecting her in some form to work the pay-per-view show although obviously she wasn't going to be close to 100% by then. She was scheduled to see a doctor early this week as there were preliminary reports the breaks could necessitate immediate surgery which would at least put a monkey wrench in the pay-per-view match or else she'd risk battling lifelong arthritis in the toe. Doug Furness, out of action with a bruised voice box stemming from a kick in a match last week against Rob Van Dam. Kensuke Sasaki, blew out his knee this past week although reports don't indicate it's an injury that will keep him out of action for any length of time. Tama and Honda and Yoshinari Ogawa, both all Japan prelim wrestlers are out of action with broken legs. Yuji Yasuriyoka, war wrestler who was scheduled to work this entire tour for New Japan but suffered a separated shoulder on the first night of the tour on April 13 and hasn't returned. K1 America officially announced on April 20th that its first show would be broadcast as a live pay-per-view on August 7th at the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas, and it should be finalizing a deal to start with regular television on ESPN1 in July to build to the first pay-per-view show. K1 hasn't been officially approved by the Nevada State Athletic Commission, although the meeting to discuss approval was scheduled to take place on April 22nd. Draka will also be scheduled for review in Nevada. UFC will not be part of the meeting. K1 in five years has gone from debuting in Japan to expanding to Switzerland with successful events built around the drawing power in that country of Andy Hug, its biggest star, 
to selling out three dome shows in 1997 and drawing a 20.7 rating in Japan for later that evening broadcast of the K1 finals. We don't have ratings information on the most recent K1 show on April 9th although it was said to be ahead of what the first show in 1997 did but not at the level of the dome shows last year, but do know that it did a strong 34 share in prime time. With the matches on April 9th more evenly fought and appearing to be more legitimate in nature than usual, because they didn't have the quick spectacular knockout finishes, the television product came off as less impressive than previous shows. To me, K1 is much like the WWF even though K1 is more realistic. Its strengths are presentation and production surrounding the product, and the least entertaining part of its presentation is the product bell to bell. With longer matches on April 9th, it meant more fighting time on television but less time for ring entrances, video packages and its unbelievable television special effects. If it can make it in the US, and introduction of any new sport is always an uphill battle, it'll be its ability to hype create stars, and give them an aura through well-produced ring entrances and how well the announcers convey the atmosphere to the TV audience that makes the difference more than the fights themselves, whether they be spectacular or not. This will be K1's second attempt to make it on pay-per-view in the United States. In 1994 they had two pay-per-view events, drawing around in 0.15 by rate, both promoted by World Championship Wrestling. Instead of being live, they were edited tapes of shows from several months earlier from Japan. For trivia note, Eric Bischoff and Sonny Wanu were the announcers for the show and spent more time on the broadcast trying to get their own martial arts prowess over and running down UFC performers like Ken Shamrock, Hoist Gracie, Kimo, and Dan Severn, which at the time was seen as a threat to pro wrestling that they spent virtually no time promoting the stars of K1, nor building context or storylines into the fights in an attempt to create any name recognition of the stars. For this attempt to be more successful, those mistakes obviously can't be repeated. As mentioned here before, where K1 is most important in connection to pro wrestling isn't the product itself, which more closely resembles kickboxing, but in its marketing and presentation, which is pro wrestling-like since promoter Kazuyoshi Ishii learned his marketing from working for a pro wrestling office rings in Japan, in 1992, prior to starting K1. The event will be sponsored by Sony PlayStation, which hopes to market the very successful in Japan K1 video game in the United States concurrent with the sports exposure in the United States. The current television plan is to begin in July, with a start date and time slot not yet finalized, with one-hour shows on ESPN. These will start with a tape of the Nagoya Dome Show in 1997, followed the next week by the Osaka Dome Show, the Tokyo Dome show, and continuing with the most recent K1 Kings show on April 9th from Yokohama. The two-hour Japanese television broadcasts of those events will be edited down to one hour with American voiceovers. As with any new venture of this type, the work of the announcers as far as educating the public to the stars, the sport and to the styles can't be overemphasized. The current plan for the first pay-per-view show will be to do an eight-man tournament, similar to the original UFC's, plus two super fights. The winner of the tournament and the other finalists will go on to the K1 Grand Prix Tournament. The plan is to feature two of K1's four biggest stars, Hug Peter Ertz, Ernesto Hust, and Mike Bernardo, in the two superfights. The Grand Prix Tournament starts on September 27 at the Osaka Dome and ends in December with the Tokyo Dome Show. Two other spots in the K1 Grand Prix Tournament will be filled by the winner and second-place finisher in a similar eight-man tournament on June 6 in Zurich, Switzerland. While UFC did make it without television before running into its own political problems, that was an aberration of the rules, and not something that would be wise to copy. Every other group that has tried that formula, including several Japanese pro wrestling slash shoot fighting groups and other UFC rivals including some which spent a lot of money on television advertising, failed trying to do pay-per-view without first having television. No pro wrestling company would be able to successfully promote pay-per-view without television exposure to hype the events, nor would boxing be able to do so without all the mainstream media exposure that boxing due to its traditions in this country receives. Wrestling's major resurgence of interest has led to numerous mainstream television stories coming up this week. On April 22, Steve Austin appears as the subject for a story on Access Hollywood. On April 24, Northeast indie wrestler Rob Alawish, who doubles as an art dealer, will be the subject of a story on the Today Show. The Entertainment Tonight segment on Nitro that was scheduled for April 24th has been moved to April 28th. On April 26th, head-to-head -head in most of the country with the WWF Unforgiven pay-per-view show, on channel will be presenting a two-hour special covering the history of pro wrestling. The first airing will be from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time with replays from midnight to 2 a.m., 
and on May 1st from 9 to 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. Japanese Television Rundown April 4th New Japan This show was largely to build up to Antonio Inoki's final match special on April 6th. The show aired clips of the first round of the Inoki tournament plus Inoki's exhibition with Nobuaki Kikuta of K1 which aired on the previous week's television show. The rest of the show consisted of three matches from the final Inoki tournament which took place earlier that day at the Tokyo Dome. After airing the Fry Ogawa final, they finished the show playing Inoki's music with the crowd chanting for him and showing him on the other side of the curtain, and as soon as he went through the curtain they basically said it would be continued on April 6th. 1. Naoya Ogawa beat Brian Johnson in 3.30 with an armbar. Johnson looked good because he's got size, quick hands and moves real well. He needs work on crowd interaction but was already better than in his previous matches. Short but okay match. 1 and 1 quarter stars. 2. Don Fry beat Igor Mindert in 3.59. Not much of a match but Fry did a good job working the crowd. Finish saw Fry throw punch after punch down and the ref stopped it to deliver a 10 count. As the ref was counting Minder down, Fry attacked his second Gerard Gordeau, who is a karate legend who did famous work pro wrestling matches against the likes of Inoki and Akira Maeda in the past and also was Hoist Gracie's opponent in the championship match of the very first UFC in 1993. They did a pull apart after the match with Fry and Minder, which was actually better than anything in the match. One quarter of one star. 3. Fry beat Ogawa in 5 minutes. Fry got heat again by not breaking on the ropes even though Ogawa would. Finally Ogawa hit his STO judo takedown and a back suplex. Ogawa hit one more suplex and then charged across the ring right into a punch by Fry and was dropped. Fry laid in the punches on the ground until Satoru Sayama threw in the towel for Ogawa. Fry noticeably saw the towel thrown in paused for dramatic effect, and then went back to punching Ogawa until Sayama ran in and started choking Fry. Johnston and Brad Rangans then pulled Sayama off Fry. Actual finish was good but match itself wasn't much. 1 star. April 11th. New Japan. 1. Shinya Hashimoto and Osamu Nishimura beat NWO Sting and Michael Wall Street when Hashimoto pinned Wall Street after a DDT while at the same time Nishimura hit Sting with a Northern Lights suplex in 1254. The last 5 minutes aired on television. 1 star 3 quarters. 2. Masahiro Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan beat Tatsumi Fujinami and Satoshi Kojima in 1354. Only the finish aired on television, ending when Chono used the SDF on Kojima. Kojima and Tenzan had great chemistry doing the mirror images gimmick. The match looked good based on what aired. After the match Chono gave an outsert Suji an Aristris necklace. 3. Jushin Liger and El Samurai and Dr. Wagner Jr. beat Koji Kanemoto and Tatsuhito Takaiwa and La Fiera in 1412 when Liger pinned Takaiwa with a front rolling cradle. Only the last few minutes aired, but what aired was excellent. 4. Kendo Kashin beat Shinjiro Otani in 1217 with a reverse armbar out of nowhere. Again only the last few minutes aired but what aired was excellent. 5. Hashimoto and Kojima beat Keiji Muto and Wall Street in 1807. Lots of outside interference with Muto really goading at Nishimura at ringside spitting on him and attacking him outside the ring. Match was a lot better than it looked on paper due to Muto, although Kojima also looked really good and Hashimoto made his good comebacks. Lots of submissions, rope breaks and saves. All hell broke loose with New Japan vs NWO after the match. Three and a quarter stars. Six. Fujinami and Kensuke Sasaki beat Chono in Big Titan in 1302. Started out pretty bad. Sasaki didn't show much and Titan was awful, although Chono and Fujinami were technically okay. They teased one spot for the dome where Sasaki lariated Fujinami when Chono moved. Chono got the STF on Fujinami, who made the ropes. Chono hit Titan with a shoulder block off the top when Sasaki moved. Sasaki then used several lariats on Titan, and made him submit to the power strangle. After the match Sasaki walked out on Fujinami to again build heat for their dome match, leaving the entire NWO slash Aristrist gang to jump him. Fujinami made the Bret Hart comeback beating them all up and once and running them off. One and three quarter stars. Puerto Rico the major show on April 11th outdoors at Juan Libriel Stadium in Bayamon only drew 3,000 fans for the Mask vs. Retirement match with Carlos Colon vs. Solitario which went 29 minutes. The two didn't even lock up until the 10 minutes mark. 
Cologne won the match to save his career, however there was no unmasking for a long time because of a fan riot with the fans hitting the ring. One fan grabbed a night stick from a police officer and attacked both Solitario and manager Rico Suave until they ran off and escaped to the dressing room without doing the unmasking. The police had to surround the dressing room as the crowd grew into an angry mob. Finally when the police quelled the crowd, Solitario came back out of the dressing room and unmasked revealing himself to be Ramon Alvarez, formerly known as El Bronco. Pierroth Jr., Biano 3, Jerry Estrada and El Texano were scheduled to return on the card but no showed and it was announced it was due to visa problems. Mexico Very little in the way of news. There is again talk of Promo Azteca breaking up into two different promotions that would actually feud with one another, but each have their own television show. One group would be composed of the wrestlers under WCW contract mainly and the other group would be the rest of the talent. This is of course subject to them getting two different shows on the air. Azteca owner Jorge Rojas has been very ill over the past week with a heart problem. April 17th at Arena Mexico was headlined by Steel, Al Venus, NCN Caras and Mascara Año 2000 vs. Rio de Jalisco Jr. and Brasso de Plata and Atlantis and Headhunters and Brasso de Oro vs. Dr. Wagner Jr. and Apollo Dantes and Gran Marcus Jr. and La Fiera and Tony Rivera and Tigre Blanco vs. Blue Panther and Black Warrior and Fishman. Better late than never department. As part of the Salvador Lederoth anniversary show on March 20th, that week would have been Uncle Sal, the first promoter of pro wrestling in Mexico who originated EMLL in the 1930s. 101st birthday if he was still alive. Too bad his nephews weren't the caliber of wrestling promoter as Vince McMahon, because they'd have gotten history so rewritten that not only would Sal have invented wrestling, but also television, radio and electricity. Anyway, they held a Campeón de Campeones tournament similar to AAA's Rey de Reyes tournament. Black Warrior, the NWA light heavyweight champion, beat Felino, the WWA welterweight champion. Ultimo Dragon, the NWA middleweight champion, beat Karloff Lagarde Jr., the CMLL welterweight champion via DQ for unmasking. Mr. Niebla, co-holder of the CMLL tag team titles, beating Universo 2000, the CMLL heavyweight champion via submission in a big upset. Atlas, the CMLL middleweight champion, beat Shocker, the other half of the tag team titles. Warrior beat Dragon in a semifinal. Luckily it was in Mexico and not the United States because not only would Ricky Steamboat be suing, but so would Jim Helwig and Titan Sports, and they'd be suing each other over who had the rights to sue over the name in the first place. Other semi saw Niebla over Atlantis in a big upset. And in the finals, Niebla beat Warrior. At this point, several Mexican wrestling legends including Cesar Valentino, Blue Demon, Doriel Dixon, Huracan Ramirez, El Nazi, Carlof Lagarde Sr., Ray Mendoza and Rio de Jalisco Sr. came to the ring to congratulate all the champions on their performances. Universo 2000 then jumped Rio Sr., who was the most charismatic wrestler in Mexico in the late 60s and early 70s. Of course this brought Rio Jr. out for the save. This was the angle that ended with Los Hermanos Dinamita and Steel setting Rio's mask on fire. All Japan Overall the Budokan Hall show on April 18th was said to have been a good show with stronger-than-usual undercard matches. The top two matches underneath the Mitsuharu Misawa vs. Jun Akiyama Carnival Final were a six-man tag where Kenta Kobashi teamed with former Kingdom wrestlers Masahito Kakiara and Yoshihiro Takayama to beat Steve Williams and Gary Albright in Wolf Hockfield in 1420 with a shocking finish of Takayama, who is one of the worst wrestlers you'll ever see but gets a push here because he's tall, pinning Williams after a German suplex and two leg drops which stunned everyone. In the other to bout, Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tawe beat Johnny Smith and Johnny Ace in 1349 when Kawada pinned Smith after a power bomb. All the hype from this point on builds for the May 1st Tokyo Dome. In the carnival matches this week, on April 14th in Aizu Wakamatsu before a sellout 1,800 Son Kawamori over Giant Kimala 2, Albright over Jun Izumaida, Kawada over Hockfield and Kobashi pinned Williams in 1206. April 15th in Gunma before 1,400 saw Williams pin Izumida in 941 with the Dr. Bomb Misawa pinned Hockfield in 1050 with the Tiger Driver. Ace pinned Tawe for what I believe would be the first time ever in a singles match in 829 with the Ace Crusher, and Kawada pinned Albright in 917 with the Enzuijiri. 
Final show of the round robin was April 16th in Koyama before a sellout 2050 as Albright beat Hockfield via submission with the STF in 1038, Ace Pindamori in 1041 with a Cobra Clutch Suplex, Akiyama drew Williams over 30 minutes and Kobashi pinned Stan Hansen in 1932 after a lariat. April 5th TV show did a 2.9 rating. New Japan With Keiji Muto out of action after the two knee surgeries, Muto and Masahiro Chono vacated the IWGP tag team titles this week. They'll be doing a tournament with four matches on June 3rd in Osaka and the finals on June 5th at Budokan Hall. In Osaka, it'll be Kensuke Sasaki and Kazuo Yamazaki vs. Michael Wall Street and Big Titan, with the winners facing Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan later on the card. On the other side of the bracket it'll be Manabu Nakanishi and Satoshi Kojima vs. Tatsutoshi Goto and Mishiyoshi Ohara with the winners facing Genichiro Tenryu. The championship match will be June 5th, which will also be the Super Junior Tournament Finals, and most likely a Tatsumi Fujinami vs. Shinya Hashimoto IWGP heavyweight title match and good shot for a title switch. The April 30th Karakuen Hall show is the Norio Onaga Retirement Show. Onaga 42, in his last match faces his biggest career rival Jushin Liger in a non-title match. Onaga will start as a full-time referee during the Super Junior Tournament. Tatsumi Fujinami broke a few fingers on April 14th in Kagoshima but is still wrestling every night. All the house show main events are being headlined by Tenryu and Koshinaka going over against New Japan wrestlers on top. Tenryu said that he was going to beat every wrestler in New Japan and then wanted to challenge Shinobu Kondori, the LLPW and WWW women's champion. Kondori said it would be an honor to get a match with a wrestler who is one of very few people in history to have pinned both Baba and Inoki and said she'd beat Tenryu with a choke. There was talk of Ultimo Dragon being the surprise last entrant in the junior tournament, but word we get now is that is most likely not going to happen. The wife of Kengo Kimura is a member of the Japanese Diet, Senate there were the expected special magazines on the recent Tokyo Dome show and Gaum also put out an Inoki career retrospective magazine which, among other things, has a list of every match in Inoki's career. April 4th TV show did a 2.6 rating and the April 6th Inoki special did a 10.2 rating. Other Japan notes. In what is probably the biggest surprise pro wrestling result, on the April 16th ring show at Osaka Furitsu Gym before an overflow crowd announced at 7,600, champion Kiyoshi Tamura lost a non-title match to unheralded Valentij and Overeem in 356 with either a heel hook or a foot lock, depending upon the source. Due to the result and the time, and we haven't seen the match yet, most of the speculation was this was a shoot match gone awry as one would think Tamura should be the heavy favorite in such a situation so they probably saw Overeem as a safe opponent that Tamura would impressively handle since Overeem is much bigger and that the problem with shoots is that things happen. Tamura has always handled himself well in shoot situations including submission wins over Kosaka, Yoshihisa Yamamoto and maybe even Maurice Smith. Nith has claimed his loss to Tamura was a shoot. The main event on the show, which was Akira Maeda's final match ever in Osaka, saw Fult Han beat Maeda in 5.43 with an armbar, which made sense since Maeda beat Han in January. Suyashi Kosaka beat Yope Castell in 7.49 also with a foot lock. It now appears that Maeda won't be able to sign Alexander Karelin so they are going to have a 12-man tournament similar to the Inoki deal where Maeda faces the winner in his retirement match in September. Fuyuki Gun ran a major show on April 17th in Sapporo as the one-year anniversary of his first show. They held a tag team tournament underneath with the winners getting a shot at Fuyuki and Haido's World Brass Knucks tag titles, and the loser of the main event would either lose his hair or mask. Masato Tanaka and Hayabusa won the tournament beating Mr. Ganesuke and Yukiro Kanemura, and then won the titles in 25-24 when Hayabusa pinned Haido, so Haido ended up getting his head shaved. Hisatsune Shinma, the son of Inoki's longtime manager Hisashi Shinma, is going to restart his Lucha Libre group with a one-week tour from June 11th to June 18th using 16 wrestlers from Mexico headline by Dos Caras. Shinma Jr., as he's known in Japanese wrestling, was the promoter who first brought and popularized Lucha Libre in Japan in 1990 when he started promoting Lucha All-Star tours with the likes of El Io del Santo, Negro Casas, Gran Hamada, Los Brazos, Blue Panther, Fuerza Guerrera. Kendo, Super Astro and was the promoter who first pushed Yoshihiro Asai, Ultimo Dragon, in Japan, and gave the first break to Great Sasuke before the formation of Michinoku Pro. Yuki Kondo of Pankrace will be leaving Japan after the April 26th pay-per-view to train in Massachusetts until September with Jason DeLucia. 
LLPW's Michiko Nagashima, 26, announced this week that she would be retiring in June after a six-year career. In Big Japan, owner Shinya Kojika is now wrestling as Masked DK, similar to the All Japan Women Masked Zap's top heel gimmick. JWP and Battlers are going to co-promote a show on May 10th in Osaka with the main event being a mixed 10-person tag match with both men and women. A surprise result this week in JWP had champion Hikari Fukuoka putting over Rieko Amano via submission in 27-27 in a non-title match, which means Amano is going to be getting the big push. Even though the house show business for Japanese women's wrestling is really bad right now, it has regained a lot of interest as a television special. In February, the TV studio show which aired after midnight on a weeknight did a phenomenal 4.5 rating. The March special on March 21st with the Kondori vs. Yumiko Hata double title unification match set up on the previous special which aired at 2.30 a.m. on a Saturday night did a 3.3 rating. Here and there. Got a clipping in the mail from a newspaper story on the retirement of a major wrestling star on September 12, 1977, and no, it wasn't Antonio Inoki or Terry Funk but I guess does relate to the Inoki story two weeks ago about retirement ceremonies. Anyway, I'll quote the story leaving out the names until the end, and no fair peeking. Whose eight-year wrestling career has been one of controversy and turmoil, retired from the ring in much the same manner before nearly 9,000 fans, in the f*** last night. The flamboyant wrestler who has been the top-drawing card in the f*** XR for several years, defeated our tribal f*** X in just under 30 minutes and announced he was sticking to his decision to call it quits. That's it, thank goodness, said in his dressing room afterwards. Some people don't think I'm serious, but I am. I'm not like a lot of wrestlers. I've saved money, made some wise investments. And I don't want to get like some of them where the people holler out, hey old man, are you going to win tonight? Promoter f added that f evidently is going to go through with this retirement. I've tried persuasion. I've tried talking to him. He seems to really have made up his mind. While opening a box of flowers sent to his dressing room, insisted that he was not going to hang around until I'm an old man. I've been fortunate. I've made a lot of money. Some fighters keep going out of necessity, because they need the money. I feel I'm smarter than the average wrestler. The story was about a match where Jerry Lawler defeated Bill Dundee, presumably for the last time, and in addition to winning that match, the stipulations which were adhered to, is that Dundee's wife at the time, Beverly, had her head shaved bald in mid-ring. Anyway, this does all relate to this past weekend since almost 21 years after his retirement, Lawler now 48, and Dundee, who must be around 60 by now wrestled in the television main event as wrestling returned to WMC TV for the first episode of Memphis Power Pro Wrestling in what was advertised as the final Lawler-Dundee match ever. Hey, those two will be going at it longer than Sheik and Bobo. The match ended up with Lawler winning via count out in what was said to have been worse than a Hogan-Piper cage match, when Austin Idol hit Dundee with a chair. Idol also 48, will wrestle Dundee in the main event on the April 25th TV show which will also feature Brian Christopher vs. Billy Travis. Earlier in the show Lawler said he was Matt Randy Hales brought Idol in since Lawler said he's no-showed more promoters than any wrestler in history. Tracy Smothers and Jimmy Valiant are scheduled for the May 2nd TV show and the promotion has regular Thursday night shows in Lula, Mississippi and Saturday night shows in Jonesboro, Arkansas before debuting in Memphis at the Mid-South Coliseum in June. Steve Nelson's next USWF show has been moved from May 23rd to June 20th in Amarillo with Paul Jones vs. Billy Scott and Evan Tanner vs. Tony Castillo as the main events. Greg Price's All-Star Wrestling on May 2nd in Salisbury, North Carolina has Rob Van Dam in the main event plus Rock and Roll Express vs. Midnight Express managed by Jim Cornette, and July 10th in Jacksonville, North Carolina has Dan Severn vs. Craig Pittman for the NWA title. Interesting trivia note is that Pittman and Severn, who have never wrestled each other, are about the same age with similar backgrounds and were teammates on one or two U.S. national teams but at the time Severn wrestled at 220 and Pittman at 286. NWA Georgia Championship Wrestling debuts on June 24 at the Cobb County Civic Center in Marietta, Georgia on a show that will include Barry Windham, Severn, Tommy Rich, Rock, and Roll Express, Doug Gilbert, Scott, Steve and Bob Armstrong, and Abdullah the Butcher. All Pro Wrestling will be doing a Vic Grimes and Aaron O'Grady farewell show on May 1 in Hayward, California and the APW Gym, with the two headlining the show in a Falls Count Anywhere match. Big Time Wrestling on April 24 in Fremont, California at Kennedy High School is headlined by Jimmy Snuka vs. Mustafa of the Gangsters. Another name we haven't heard of in a long time, 
Don Morocco has resurfaced for Northern States Wrestling in the Detroit area. On May 22nd in Westland, Michigan and the Wayne Ford Civic League, he'll appear on a show along with Honky Tonk Man. If you bring an observer to the door, you can get $2 off any ticket. The Insane Clown Posse is going to work regularly for this group all summer long as they'll be in town working on their new release. June 12th in Ann Arbor, Michigan has Morocco vs. Honky and Tito Santana vs. Greg Valentine and on June 13th they will be doing a show in Chicago with Insane Clown Posse vs. Chicken Boys in a cage match and Madman Pondo vs. Angel in a Man vs. Woman Thumb Tax Death Match. From the Denton TX, Record Chronicle in the Police Section. A man called his estranged wife from prison saying that he knew she was cheating on him and he was going to go to the house and beat her up. He told his wife, when your pager reads 316, your ass is mine. Later that day her pager went off, it read 316. She called the police, several units arrived, but as it turned out, the husband was still in prison. This week those same guys are probably giving each other golden showers and thinking it's cool. A group called Legends of Pro Wrestling headed by Wade Gann and Tormund DeLon have been drawing 600 to 800 fans for monthly cards in Sheffield, Alabama and their most recent show on April 18th had Davey Rich, Carl Fergie, Mike Samples, and Sid Vicious. A group called Soul City Wrestling in Philadelphia actually has a date booked at the ECW Arena on May 23rd. Ross to the Voodoo Man, a former Northeast indie wrestler who has been mainly working of Otto Wands in Austria the past few years, was on April 12th show in Homebush, Australia. Independent Wrestling Federation on May 30th in Nutley, New Jersey at the Parks and Rec Building has Don Montoya vs. Steve Corino on top. Empire Wrestling Federation on May 2nd in Bloomington, California at the high school has Suicide Kid vs. Bobby Bradley Jr. on top. Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling on May 15th in Reading, Pennsylvania at the Cloister and May 16th in Wind Gap, Pennsylvania at the middle school had Christian Cage, Sexton Hardcastle, Adam Copeland, Reckless Youth, Julio Sanchez, Flash Flanagan, Marlena, Brian Lee, and Two Cold Scorpio. NHB. Extreme Challenge ran a show on April 18th in Cedar Rapids, Iowa using Dan Severn as the headliner as he increased his NHB record to 19-3-2 beating Travis Fulton, 29-2, with a key lock submission in 10-39. Severn had a 70-pound advantage and took Fulton down at the bell and dominated him for most of the match. Evan Tanner, the USWF heavyweight champion, made his NHB debut on this show winning a tournament by first knocking out Wade Crows in one minutes after several knees, including to the face, and then winning the finals over Dennis Reed in 1.30 with a triangle choke. It was a weird four-man tournament as Reed lost an alternates match, but wound up in the finals when the first-round winner in the main draw, Alan Mulring, couldn't continue despite winning his match in 30 seconds, and Mark Jackville, who beat Reed in 3.07 with an armbar in the alternates match, also couldn't continue. The show scheduled for this past week in Tel Aviv was postponed. ECW with Shane Douglas out of action, and Taz being injured in the angle that opened the show, the April 18th ECW Arena show before a sellout 1,500 was described as a night that they just had to get through. It opened with Blue Meanie and Supernova beating the FBI and Chris Chetty and Jerry Lynn over Amish Roadkill and Danny During. Axel Rotten beat Chris Condito. After the match with Balls Mahoney and Rotten working on Condito, Bam Bam Bigelow came out and laid on both Axel and Balls, including giving the greetings from Asbury Park, Michinoku Driver, on Balls who did a stretcher job. The next match was scheduled as Just Incredible vs. Spike Dudley, but with Jason and Chastity interfering freely and Spike juicing heavily, and having to be carried out, it turned into a no contest very quickly. Mikey Whipwreck came out and continued the match with Credible going over, although Whipwreck did hit Nicole Base with a whipper snapper. Stone Cold Stunner. New Jack pinned Darren Drozdoff in a bad match. Al Snow beat Sabu in a weird match when Rob Van Dam came out for no apparent reason and threw in the towel for Sabu. They tried a lot of stuff but the finish came off as horrible live. Sabu suffered a cut over his eye on a table spot. Dudley's no contest with Tommy Dreamer and two cold Scorpio went in the middle of the bout after just a few minutes. The lights went out, and when they went on, Sandman was in the ring and the Dudleys left and Sandman cut a promo. Although Sandman is really banged up, the injury from last week was a work to build up the pay-per-view match. Finally Rob Van Dam beat Bigelow in a match nowhere near as good as their previous match. At one point Sabu came out with a towel to throw it in, but several undercard wrestlers dragged it into the back before he could do so. Bigelow pressed Bill Alfonso overhead and threw him into the crowd, but that distracted Bigelow allowing Van Dam to use a low blow to set up the win. 
Beulah returned at the show. Doug Furness missed the weekend due to the injury and Lance Storm missed the weekend due to visa problems. Storm may not have everything taken care of in time for this coming weekend, but will almost surely be back for the pay-per-view show. The April 17th show in New Britain, Connecticut drew about 525 and was described as a below-par show with the top outs as Dreamer and Whipwreck over Jason and Credible, Bigelow over Scorpio and Van Dam over Spike. On TV, they were pushing the Van Dam vs. Bigelow match as the match of the year and already saying that the Sabu vs. Van Dam match on the pay-per-view will be the match of the year. It's risky billing a match as such before it happens because it creates the elevated expectations that are hard to live up to. Even before Douglas was hurt the plan was for Sabu and Van Dam to go long to have time to pull off what they need to. The November to Remember pay-per-view will take place on November 1st. Reckless Youth is expected to start on April 25th. Masato Tanaka from FMW will come in full-time in June and stay through December. He'll probably get a major push both because it's politically advantageous to do so in Japanese relations, and also because, despite him having a bad match on his first pay-per-view show, he's one hell of a worker. Atsushi Onita will also be coming in June, although probably not wrestling, but will start building up the explosive match that will take place later in the year. The match may just be on a house show outdoors and them selling it on video because pay-per-view won't allow them to use barbed wire, they'll allow them to set people on fire and blow them up so if it's on pay-per-view the barbed wire part of the match will have to be changed. Expect the May 3rd show to be based more on hard wrestling and strong angles and less on extreme violence and blood because Paul Heyman is doing the show in conjunction with cable companies and doesn't want to get the execs grossed out and with a current monopolistic pay-per-view environment. Just getting one or two of the wrong people mad at this point when it comes to a marginal pay-per-view entity which at this point ECW still is, doesn't make for smart business. They will be debuting soon in Cleveland. On the TV angle where Sandman was carried off after being attacked by the Dudleys, they showed his wife Lori crying similar to Sonny in the Terry Funk slash Cactus Jack angle. Funny because the last time she was on television she had kidnapped his son, done a heroin addict gimmick, and fled off to parts unknown with Raven. Concrete Marketing Incorporated will be putting out an ECW entrance music CD album, so expect ECW to move away from using popular hits for entrance music and go along the lines of WWF and WCW. In September ECW will have a Friday night 11.30pm clearance on Waddle, Channel 38, in Detroit. WCW The streak of bad television ended with a hot nitro on April 20th in Colorado Springs, Colorado before a sellout 6,479 paying $123,094. Show opened with 30 minutes of interviews building up the Hogan Savage and Raven Goldberg matches with Savage introducing Nash as the new leader of the NWO. Conan beat Chris Adams in 335 with the Tequila Sunrise. Barbarian pinned Wayne Bloom with a foot to the face in 115 of a terrible short match. Chris Jericho retained the cruiserweight title beating Juventud Guerrera in 342 of a great match which was way too short. Finish saw Guerrera in the Lion Tamer, but he refused to tap out and ended up passing out from the pain, and the referee stopped the match. Jericho then looked down and started crying screaming oh my god, I killed Juvie. It was hilarious. Guerrera also got a shockingly huge crowd reaction. Goldberg pinned Raven with a jackhammer on a stop sign in 456 to win the US title. Match was tremendous with unreal heat. The flock kept interfering to no avail, ending when Mike Balia hit Goldberg with the stop sign but Goldberg no-sold the same spot that beat Page for the title, I'll bet Page was thrilled with that, used the jackhammer on 370-pound Ron Race, and then to Raven. La Parca pinned Ultimo Dragon in 452 after a corkscrew moonsault block when Eddie Guerrero ordered Chavo Guerrero Jr. to interfere to cause Dragon to lose, which he did. Another good match. Chris Benoit beat Kurt Hennig via DQ in 238 when Rick Rude interfered and Booker T made the save. It wound up with Benoit again mad at T for saving him, and they brawled again. Hennig was selling his right knee big time and while part of it was clearly a work, his knee does appear to be in bad shape. Roddy Piper did an interview saying that nobody would be allowed to interfere in the Hogan Savage match, boy, he hasn't been watching TV, has he? And also challenged Hogan to a match. Saturn double count out Hammer in 409. Some spots were decent but some of the match got pretty bad including the finish. Scott Steiner and Marcus Bagwell over Public Enemy in 7-10 when P.E. went through a table when Bagwell moved and Bagwell used the buff blockbuster on Rocco after asking Scott to tag out when Scott had him beat. 
Steiner and Bagwell do have great chemistry from a personality standpoint together and this match was better than you'd think. Booker T pinned Sikosis in 752 with the missile dropkick. Match actually fell apart in spots and wasn't good most of the way, however Sikosis selling and T's explosiveness at the finish were very good. Lex Luger pinned Brian Adams with the forearm after racking both Vincent and Conan, without a DQ being called despite blatant interference right in front of the ref, in 502. It was actually decent. Hogan beat Savage for the title in 1537. It was clear both guys after working hard the previous night had nothing left to give. Hogan had to carry it as Savage was physically gone and Hogan looked horrible in doing so. It was pitiful, but the finish was great. Savage used the elbow off the top but sold his knee. Hogan used a figure four, it took him so long to get it on I thought he was going to have to pull out one of those diagrams they had Disco Inferno use last year, and everyone looked to the back waiting for interference. Savage made the ropes instead. Savage threw down ref Nick Patrick. Ed Leslie used a sloppy neckbreaker on Patrick and both beat up Savage including wrapping his knee around the post four times and Leslie used a stunner on him using the title belt. Kevin Nash ran into clean house, but Bischoff grabbed his leg. They triple-teamed Nash until Leslie held him and Hogan went to hit him and Nash moved so Hogan his Leslie. Nash tried the jackknife on Hogan but Bischoff stopped him, but finally Nash broke free and did the jackknife on Hogan. At this point Bret Hart ran in and hit Nash with the title belt and pulled the dead Hogan on top of Savage and Patrick revived, and counted the fall for the title change. At this point Piper ran out and couldn't understand what happened, and Hart decked Piper. The storyline behind all this, and believe me, this will probably change 1,000 times before it ever happens, is that Hart is going hill but will be involved in a long-term program against Hogan. The deal is that Hart is obsessed with winning the title from Hogan but can't do so unless Hogan is the champion so he's going to make sure Hogan keeps the title until he gets a shot at him. Of course Hogan will continually refuse to wrestle him. Piper was apparently supposed to say why Brett why? As his cue before Hart punched him but forgot the line in time was running out on TV. It's amazing that here we are five months later and the climax of two competitive shows were still based largely around the finish of one match. Hey it's the only wrestling finish in history that is going to spawn its own movie as well. It appears the Worcester Slambury pay-per-view show will be headlined by Hogan vs Nash and Piper vs Hart. Not sure what the end result will be, but the situation involving Ultimo Dragon and his name should go down within a few weeks and probably wind up with him having a new name. When Hogan was on Jay Leno on April 13th, he never once mentioned WCW or Nitro, nor for that matter pro wrestling except in a passing reference to no longer playing good guy, nor did he plug the pay-per-view show that was only six days away, all of which raised a lot of eyebrows. But say what you want, it won't go unnoticed that the week WWF won in the ratings was the week Hogan was doing Leno. Eric Watts had a tryout dark match on the April 16th Thunder show from Fargo, North Dakota losing to Yuji Nagata and apparently didn't look good. The situation with Raven and the fans attacking him supposedly started as a shoot but it wasn't the second time. The deal in Tallahassee people are insisting was real because the guy really was arrested. A lot of people who know Raven thought even that was a work as the feeling is he'd do something like that to give the illusion that he is super heat with the fans. The second time in Minneapolis, when he was blindsided, it was an angle as it was Chris Cluseritis, Mortis, who did it. They were supposed to do it a third time on the pay-per-view but this time the fan would help Raven beat Page, in this case being Mike Balia, but in this case smarter heads prevailed as they felt doing this regularly and glorifying it would just encourage more fans to attack wrestlers, and the last time they got on this role people were hitting the ring and fan violence was getting out of control. Speaking of the Minneapolis Nitro on April 13th, the Target Center released a $310,000 gross figure and claimed it was the largest wrestling gross ever in the building. The paid ticket gross was $279,000, but apparently a corporate deal to buy a lot of tickets wasn't figured into the first total which is where the $310,000 figure adds up to. Anyway, while it wouldn't be the largest wrestling crowd ever in the Twin Cities, the Hogan vs. Nick Bockwinkle match in 1983 sold out the St. Paul Civic Center and drew more than 5,000 more on closed circuit making a total of about 23,000, it would break the market's all-time gross record set on April 20, 1986 for a cage matches at the Metrodome with Greg Gagne and Jimmy Snuka vs. Bruiser Brody and Northern Barbarian, Road Warriors vs. Freebirds, Vern Gagne vs. Sheik Adnan Elkasi and Bockwinkle vs. Stan Hansen for the AWA title, that drew $300,000. Thunder on April 16 at the Fargo Dome destroyed every record in that market drawing 15362 paying $274,393.
Show also did a 4.2 rating and 6.8 share for the live show, peaking at a 5.1 for the main event, and a 1.3 rating and 4.7 share for the replay. It was pretty bad. Rick Steiner beat Bagwell via DQ in 250 when Scott interfered and Luger made the save. Kevin Nash did an interview quoting from a 20-year-old song. Next thing you know somebody will be doing an interview and quoting the song Afternoon Delight. Goldberg pinned Barry Darso with the jackhammer in 150. Real bad. T pinned Rick Fuller with a dropkick off the top in 258. Fuller needs to drop some weight as he was moving too slowly to be a 90s star even though he's got the size and look. Benoit beat Norton via DQ in 327 when Vincent interfered. Fans were really pissed with this finish and it was the wrong kind of pissed off. T saved Benoit as he was getting pounded but Benoit shoved him down and yelled at him about needing no help. Piper and Giant did an interview. Piper got no crowd reaction, Giant just stood there and said nothing, and Piper made no sense. Hennig beat Super Kolo with a fisherman suplex in 249. Jericho kept the title beating Chavo Jr. in 219 with a lion tamer. Chavo almost made the ropes but Eddie kept him from doing so and Chavo tapped out while Eddie put a towel over his head in embarrassment. Eddie told Chavo that if he could beat Jericho at the pay-per-view, then was corrected since the opponent was Dragon, that Chavo wouldn't have to listen to him anymore, but if he lost, he'd write him twice as hard. JJ did one of those interviews that made no sense that WCW is famous for. He said that Savage wouldn't be allowed to use the cast on the pay-per-view and wouldn't be allowed to wrestle until his arm was examined and he got a doctor's release. He of course said nothing about the fact Savage was going to wrestle later in the show with the cast on. Giant beat Brian Adams via DQ in 112 and the NWO interfered but Giant cleaned house on all of them. Saturn beat Silver King in 109 with the rings. Finally Hart and Sting beat Savage and Nash via DQ at 813. Nash's hair is now three different colors, dyed black, some of the natural gray, and dyed blonde. Match was bad as Nash had to carry the whole thing as Savage didn't do anything until the finish. Sting went for a stinger splash but hit his head on Savage's cast and was KO'd. Savage was on the top and waited there forever to do the elbow before Leslie showed up to knock him off the top for the DQ and then Hogan destroyed Savage's arm running it into the post after the match. There were apparently orders given and not followed up on in Minneapolis on April 13th to not let Jesse Ventura's camera crew in. Ventura was stealing the spotlight during every commercial break and apparently on radio was saying he might show up to beat up Hogan. The two have tremendous personal heat in real life and in the building several times teased hitting the ring. He passed out Ventura for Governor's stuff which was all over TV. Lodi will be needing a second ankle surgery as he re-injured the ankle training for his return. Good to see ref Mark Curtis gaining some weight back every week. Dusty Rhodes is still with the company despite rumors to the contrary. He's doing some booking ideas, supposedly there to contribute ideas to give some angles for the mid-card wrestlers. No word on if he'll be used on television when Scott Hall returns, or when Hall will return although word has it Hall should be back sometime next week. The $4.99 direct TV pay-per-view airings of the Nitro telecasts the day after the regular PPV starts on the May 18th show in Providence. The shows are entitled Backstage Blast as they'll have backstage interviews with Lee Marshall during the Nitro commercials. House shows this week were Saturday night taping on April 14th in Mankato, Minnesota drew 2,941 paying $51,170, April 15th, in Duluth drew 2,846 paying $51,800 and April 17th in Sioux Falls, South Dakota drew a sellout 6,311 paying $111,415. Not including the Denver pay-per-view show, merchandise for the week was $352,580 or $10.38 per head. With flair out, the house shows were headlined by Paige over Hennig and Luger Pinning Nash. Arn Anderson has written an autobiography called Arn Anderson, A Look Behind the Curtain which should be available in a few weeks through the internet. Speaking of the internet, on the broadcast of Nitro, during the Hogan-Savage match when Hogan was destroying Savage's leg, Mark Madden stated that it makes them even as now each has one useless appendage, Savage's leg and Hogan having beefcake. Now that Goldberg has the US title, the question now becomes who do they program him with and how they work him in programs while keeping him unblemished at least until he reaches 99-0 or is ready for a huge money match on top. For now, the best idea is still to feed him people rather than have him do programs with anyone. The St. Paul Pioneer Press ran an article on April 13th on Vern Gagne written by former newsletter writer Chris Pope, with a large color photo of 72-year-old Vern strutting around with no shirt on wearing his old AWA title belt.
Actually for his age Vern was in great shape although facially he looks, if anything, older than 72. I just hope when we all get 72 and senile that the local paper doesn't shoot photos of us with our shirts off strutting around with make-believe championship belts and quoting us being so bitter about the state of the industry that is setting new business records every week. In response to the sellout for Nitro Vern said, we were doing that every month. Nowadays, they come to town four times a year and have one sellout and say it's a lot. In reality, the AWA in its heyday, 1981 to 1983 drew many sellouts in St. Paul, but averaged about 16,000, just under capacity, when Hogan headlined and about 8,000 when Hogan was in Japan, and never sold out again after Hogan went to the WWF. Ventura had some bitter quotes in the article about Ganya saying that he treated his talent like crap, and Ganya responded saying that nobody in this town would know who, Ventura, was if we didn't put him on television. Ganya, whose son-in-law is Larry Zabishko, said he hardly ever watches pro wrestling anymore. The article also included A Where Are They Now? of former AWA stars. It called Ventura perhaps the state's most famous wrestler and talked about him possibly running for governor on the Reform Party ticket, said Nick Bockwinkel, is selling life insurance in the area, is planning on moving to Las Vegas, Greg Gagne is selling cars in Bloomington, Ken Patera is running a gym in St. Paul and also is training wrestlers, Larry Hennig is selling real estate in Elk River, Stan Kowalski is active in community affairs in Spring Lake Park, Adnan Elkazi ran a deli that went out of business three years ago, Baron Von Rasch lives in Lake George where he and his wife run a souvenir shop called The Wigwam and Jim Brunzel is a sales rep for a novelty company. After Thunder on April 16, TBS presented the movie Stone Cold. Normally they have two or three WCW wrestlers plugging the movie that follows Thunder, but for some reason, there were no wrestlers plugging that movie. WCW Saturday Night on April 18th did a 2.3 rating. WWF Some more notes from the Raw that aired on April 20th taped April 14th at the Nassau Coliseum before a sellout 10736 paying $245,771. Even though WWF has better stories, it is clear that when WCW can deliver a wrestling product, WWF doesn't have the talent to come close. Show opened with Vince McMahon in Dude Loves Love Shack. It was pretty bad. Farouk beat Kama in 604 with a sidewalk slam in an awful match which included a bat, a belt, a beer keg, a hammer as weapons. DX did an interview where they triple dog dared Triple H to whip it out on television. They came out with Triple H wearing a trench coat vowing to whip it out and showed spraying water on the fans from behind but when the camera shot him from the front he was spraying a super soaker and not urinating or giving the fans a golden shower. Both terms, by the way, that Jim Ross used to hype the segment. LOD and Owen came out for a challenge to set up a six-man later in the show. Dan Severn beat Mosh with a kneeling arm bar in 241. Severn looks every bit as out of place in the WWF as Bob Backlund did before the heel turn. Bradshaw beat Goldust via DQ in 456 when Club Kamikaze all attacked Bradshaw and he was laid out when Togo gave him the sentence off the top. Since Bradshaw, who is probably 6'6 six six legit, is deceptively tall, just having him stand next to the KK guys who are all around 5'3 makes them look even more like midget wrestlers and made the whole segment weird-looking comedy. Luna, who was really cracking me up, pointed out to the crowd she was going to not only strip Sable down, but remove her bra and panties on pay-per-view which of course was emphasized in the commentary the rest of the show. Austin did an interview where he promised to get at McMahon before the end of the show. Terry Funk and 2 Cold Scorpio, who was announced when he came out under that name, but when he won the graphic read TCS Funk beat Midnight Express in 704 when Scorpio used the 450 on Bob. Severn did a run-in after the match and put Scorpio in an armbar. Val Venus was coming again. Sable did her interview. She built up to her one line about not caring out whether she gets all her clothes torn off as long as she gets at Luna, and then got out of there. Triple H and Outlaws beat LOD and Owen in 1125 when X-Pac hit Animal with a chair and Billy Gunn pinned him after a pile driver. Hawk wrestled like he was walking in his sleep, but the bout was decent since Owen worked most of the way setting up the hot tag. Kane and Paul Bearer came out with caskets and they set the casket on Undertaker's father on fire. Undertaker came out for the save but Kane choke slammed him into his mother's casket and they showed close-ups of rotted out bones and worms all over the place. Finally McMahon came out as an announcer for Dude Love vs. Steve Blackman. Vince did his late 80s time warp hard sell for the pay-per-view. He guaranteed something catastrophic would happen on the show. He said he'd be at ringside for the title match and basically tried to paint the picture he'd do to Austin what he did to Bret Hart, even to the point of talking about wanting Earl Heckner to ref.
Unfortunately, there was no heat at all for the match and the bell rang out of nowhere with Dude having an abdominal stretch on Blackman in 358, similar to the heart finish. Wrestling, being the copycat business that it is, that heart finish, being the most famous match finish in modern history, will be it is copied to death but what people fail to realize and I've seen it on indies myself, and this was another example, the finish sucks. It was okay here because it was a TV match to build a story for pay-per-view when they tease it happening again and it doesn't, but as the ending to an arena show is horrible. The idea is that McMahon told Mark Eaton to ring the bell because he wanted Dude to win since he used Dude to save him in the confrontation and wants him to win the title. Blackman attacked Eaton. Austin clotheslined Dude and attacked McMahon but Dude saved McMahon. Austin wound up using stunners on Pat Patterson and Jerry Briscoe as they blocked him from getting at Vince and they ended the show with Ross asking is Vince going to screw Austin out of the title Sunday? There is some talk of repackaging the Godwins with a bodyguard gimmick. There was some sort of a confrontation backstage at the Raw taping in Philadelphia between Dennis Coraluzzo and Jerry Lawler. Coraluzzo was trying to book Brian Christopher and Lawler didn't want his son working for him because, among other things, he was upset that Coraluzzo allowed Burt Prentice into the NWA. There is also heat because Coraluzzo is close to the Gilbert family and Doug Gilbert and Lawler aren't exactly on good terms since Gilbert left a threatening message on Lawler's answering machine when somehow Gilbert got word, apparently from Sid Ayuti, that Lawler had said something derogatory about Eddie Gilbert. Mark Merrow is still out of action with both pneumonia and bronchitis, while Barry Windham has also been out of action with an illness and Miguel Perez with a lower back injury. Austin vs. Dude Love was officially announced as the pay-per-view main event. At press time Greensboro had sold 16,400 tickets for $280,000 and there are only a few hundred tickets left, and with comps there will be around 20,000 in the building. The all-time paid attendance record and gate record for that building, when it was much smaller, was about 19,000, with about 4,500 watching on closed circuit, and $380,000 for the 1986 Starcade headlined by Ric Flair vs. Nikita Koloff so those records may not be broken even though the Coliseum has been remodeled for 22,000 capacity. Some absolutely useless wrestling historical trivia. With his tag title win on March 30th in Albany, New York, Billy Gunn now joins Mike Rotunda slash IRS and Tony Garia as the man with the most reigns as WWF. Tag Team Champion, 5, in the history of the Federation. Reserve a spot in Cooperstown for that guy. And if that isn't enough, for those of you into your NWA wrestling history, Severance reign as champion, which started on March 24, 1995 when he beat Chris Condito at Erlanger, Kentucky has now passed the three-year mark. In the long and illustrious history of the NWA, that makes Severance the third longest uninterrupted championship reign of all time, trailing only Luthez November 27, 1949 through March 15, 1956, and Dory Funk Jr. February 11, 1969 through May 24, 1973. Realistically it isn't even the same NWA title, but from a legal standpoint it is. It is believed that Club Kamikaze will go by the names Togo, Dick Togo of course, Teo, Men's Teo, and Sho, Shoichi Fanaki. It is not definite but was considered a probable that Wally Yamaguchi will end up managing them. Sonny is not scheduled to go full-time on the road with LOD 2000, but will make the Northeastern dates and major shows when the WWF doesn't have her booked elsewhere. Ken Shamrock's combination autobiography and fighting training manual called Inside the Lion's Den came out this past week and it is available at many major bookstores. Haven't seen a copy but was told by someone who read it that the bio stuff was very good and the training stuff was okay. I believe the book doesn't go much at all into his WWF, but that the stuff on UFC, UWF and Pancrase was interesting, and that there was no mention of his tenure in PWFG. Speaking of Shamrock, his brother Rob just won a tournament on an Indian reservation and will be fighting in IFC Austin. DX and WWF Attitude t-shirts are now available in t-shirt shops in a lot of the malls around the country. Al's shows this weekend saw April 15th in Scranton, Pennsylvania draw 3,399 paying $61,435, April 16th in Hershey, Pennsylvania drew 7,784 paying $148,670, April 17th in Lowell, Massachusetts drew 5,858 and $112,806, April 18th in New Haven drew 8,069 and $148,897, and April 19th in Springfield, Massachusetts drew 5,928 and $109,723. Scranton, Hershey and New Haven were all very close to full but none were sellouts. 
Merchandise for the week was $379,630 or $9.09 per head. With Shamrock injured, they got to the Farouk Rocky singles matches sooner than they wanted to, doing the run-in DQ finishes. They had midnights doing jobs for bangers so that shows how much credibility they're putting in the NWA tag belts. The main events were Undertaker Kane the first three nights, with Undertaker winning clean, and Austin Helmsley the next two with Undertaker Kane underneath, on show where Austin went over clean on top and also uses the stunner on China right before the finish, Taker Kane was a run-in DQ finish. On most of the shows they keep the prelims under 10 minutes and go 15 to 17 for the WWF title match. The training camp guys will be working indie shows on May 15th in Lynn, Massachusetts at the Armory and May 16th in Whitman, Massachusetts at the Armory along with Midnight Express with Jim Cornette and Jeff Jarrett. Livewire on April 18th did a 1.6 rating and Superstars the next day did a 1.8. The Reader's Pages Bischoff Is it possible for Eric Bischoff's ego to get any bigger? The fact he says that Steve Austin would be a mid-card wrestler in WCW and is a big fish in a small pond makes one wonder. Jim Caldwell. Saratoga Springs, New York. Does Eric Bischoff really believe Steve Austin would be a mid-card wrestler in WCW? Is he trying to convince himself or us? The only reason Austin wasn't on top in WCW when he was there was because he wasn't part of any political cliques. Austin is the most over-pro wrestler of the last 10 years bar none. Bischoff is clueless of what to do with Bret Hart and Davy Boy Smith is as close to being a jobber as there is. I'm still not used to seeing WWF pay-per-view shows without Bret Hart. Russ Duda. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Ratings Breakdowns. I applaud your ratings breakdowns per wrestler and your close examination of the ratings and shares. Whether you are a casual or intense follower of pro wrestling, these figures are the true representation of the industry. Like any other television programming, when the numbers aren't there, wrestling will be removed from the airwaves. In the 1970s, the WWWF could only be seen in the New York metropolitan area on a Spanish-language UHF station. It wasn't until the advent of cable that it was able to obtain a substantial viewership even though it always did well live in Madison Square Garden. Just as the Los Angeles Dodgers are going to be just another programming commodity for Rupert Murdoch, so is WCW for Time Warner and the WWF for Barry Diller. All the soap opera storylines, double entendres, costume changes and gimmick matches in the world can take place. But if they don't draw viewers, the game is over. Terry Balia, Randy Poffo and Mark Calloway may not be able to fight a lick in the ring, but it is the return they provide via advertising and pay-per-view buys that makes them valuable. The egos on Monday night, Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff, may think they are the powers behind the current popularity of wrestling, but the carpet can be pulled out from under them in a minute by the distributors of the product. Do you think all the shoot remarks made by wrestlers when they switch organizations really draws viewers? Did Sean Waltman's blistering salvo against Bischoff and Balia really help the WWF or does it make the viewer turn to the competition to see if there is a response? Steve Miller. New Brunswick, New Jersey. Response from Dave Meltzer. I don't think there is any question remarks like that draw ratings these days. Fans watch wrestling to see conflict. When they believe the conflict they are seeing is real and people believe those remarks are real because they aren't typical wrestling, they get more into the product. Most fans recognize the real war is WWF versus WCW, and anything interpromotional because people know it's real, is going to cause more interest than the fake traditional angles on the shows. How much? How much of a screw-up do you have to be to get shunned by the wrestling business? Kevin Way calls attacks a promoter yet is set for a push. Jake Roberts has supposedly filled his body with countless amounts of drugs and burned many promoters, but his return seems to be imminent. Brian Adams suffered a highly public arrest and was immediately disavowed by his own company, yet he was brought back and given a push despite limited talent. I'd say murder would be the taboo, but there's still a lot that we don't know about the Jimmy Snuka story. I wouldn't be surprised to see Mel Phillips return as Goldust manager. I'd say it's unprecedented, but there's always boxing, where a criminal record is not only acceptable, but it practically helps one become more of a drawing card. Matt Creamer. Green Bay, Wisconsin. Music City Wrestling. I'd like to respond to Eric Bimbin's letter in the February 9th issue. I disagree with his prediction about the future of Music City Wrestling. While it is true that Burt Prentice has had many failures in the past, the big difference this time is he has money behind him. I live in Nashville and have seen this thing close up. The plus side is Jarrett's money, TV syndication and several good young workers like Flash Flanagan, Wolfie D, Shane Eden and Nick Dinsmore. The supercards have been really fun. 
the February 7th February reunion was by far the weakest show, but had the best crowd yet showing that the Rock and Roll Express can still draw down here. On the minus side, I really miss the creative USWA booking. Prentice keeps everything simple. The USWA TV show was special while Music City is not. They need to put the TV interviews over the house PA and it really hurts that the live crowd can't hear the interviews. They desperately need to expand. Almost all of their shows have been in Nashville or close to it. They've canceled shows in Memphis, Chattanooga, and Illinois. There is a faithful 200 or so fans that come to every Nashville show. I also don't like Prentice constantly promoting Music City as family entertainment. He stopped selling beer under the guise of presenting family entertainment. I also wish he catered to a smarter crowd, but I know that's asking too much, which brings me to the IWA. I love the IWA. It's my favorite promotion in the US to attend. It's an ECW knockoff but the work rate is great. It caters to smart fans. While the IWA arena is a dump, it has great atmosphere. I go to Louisville, which is two and a half hours away, whenever my schedule permits. Ian Rotten is not a terrible worker. I find his matches interesting because while his heart is clearly in garbage wrestling, I see a lot of amateur wrestling in his style as well. It's a strange but entertaining combination. I see him as closer to Cactus Jack than to Tommy Dreamer, and he's also a good creative booker. I love his undercard wrestlers like Tarek the Great and American Kickboxer. It's like seeing a J Cup match. I was looking at an old after mag that had a story about Hulk Hogan beating Nick Bockwinkle in a no DQ match, but in the locker room they took the title away from Hogan for throwing Bockwinkle over the top rope. The story said AWA officials changed the no-DQ stipulation during the match saying the title was too valuable to be contested in a no-DQ match. I wondered if you knew the real story behind this. The way the story read, the crowd left thinking Hogan was the AWA champion. What a business killer. How could Bockwinkle go back and defend the title with any credibility at all? Trent Vandress. Madison, Tennessee. Response from Dave Meltzer, the after mags in that era tended to make up their own storylines and angles to glorify the wrestlers they felt had the most photogenic look and attempt to make them megagods and superheroes to their magazine audience, Road Warriors, Hogan, Kerry Von Erich and Lex Luger come to mind from that era just as Mil Mascaras, Bruno Sammartino and Billy Graham were years earlier. In this case, the story was basically accurate except the part about the matches being with no DQ stips, which was a storyline ad to make it look like the magazine superhero had been jobbed even worse by politics. In 1983, Vern Gagne booked Hogan Bockwinkel matches with that finish in most of the major cities on the circuit. They had these bouts in all the major cities on the circuit but the most famous match of all was in St. Paul where they drew a sellout of 17,000 to the Civic Center and the interest was so strong they had to close circuit the show into another building where they drew another 6,000. The matches would end with Hogan pinning Bockwinkle, after a ref bump, Lord James Bleers was the ref in the famous match, with the ref missing Hogan throwing Bockwinkle over the top rope before the finish, which was an automatic DQ. Fans would go home thinking they had seen a title change and then the next week on television would be informed that the late Stanley Blackburn, who was actually in attendance in Minneapolis although in the other cities simply reversed the decision after watching the tape, had reversed the referee's decision because of the top rope infraction. Ganya often booked finishes where fans left the building thinking they had seen a title change, only to find out watching television the next week that they hadn't, and there were a lot of people in wrestling at the time who felt it was in the long run bad business. Dusty Rhodes did the same thing at the third Starcade in 1985 which was the climax of a tremendous angle between himself and Ric Flair, where he pinned Flair clean on a show which not only was a sellout live in Greensboro, but on closed circuit throughout the Carolinas doing more than $900,000 in business which was, with the exception of the first WrestleMania a few months earlier, unheard of by the standards of that time. WCW did the same thing last year it sold out in the Steiners vs. Hall and Nash match. The next week on TV it was explained that since there was outside interference, helping Flair, no less, it should have been Flair losing via DQ rather than pin, and thus Flair was still the champion. In this specific case, it actually was the catalyst for a tremendous house show run not only in the Crockett circuit but even in non-Crockett cities with Flair vs. Rhodes on top. But as with everything in wrestling, a good idea is repeated so often it becomes a terrible idea. Ganya's business did take a turn for the worst, but it was due to Hogan and others leaving his company for WWF the next year than because of finishes of that ilk, although there was a residual effect in all his cities from those finishes. However, 
there is an unmistakable direct correlation between the decline to the level of near death when it comes to attendance at every major arena in the Carolinas and other NWA stronghold cities in the late 1980s and the proliferation of what became known inside as dusty finishes in those buildings. Taking that basic idea from Starcade, and it had been around forever before then, and literally doing it once a month in every city because it worked so well the first time. It should be noted that Hogan had already become the biggest drawing card in U.S. wrestling by 1983 when working for Vern Gagne before Vince McMahon signed him to a bigger money offer to jump at the end of that year and promised him the WWF title. While McMahon did take Hogan to a mainstream level, he did not in any way shape or form create the Hogan box office power. Gagne didn't really either, it just happened right under Gagne's nose and he just capitalized on it. Ganya never made Hogan AWA champion for a number of reasons despite him being the company's biggest draw. There was the thought that due to Hogan's immense size, remember what got Hogan over was being the steroid fuel giant of supposedly 6 foot 9 and 340 pounds, and he was about 6 foot 5 and over 300 at the time, during a period when most of the wrestlers were 5 foot 10 and 205 and most of the AWA wrestlers were ancient and he was young and hip. That challengers wouldn't be credible against him as a babyface champion and thus his title matches wouldn't draw, not to mention his limits of what he could do in the ring. That feeling actually remained in the industry as late as 1986 and even 1987, even though at the time Hogan as WWF champion was drawing record business and became perhaps the hottest attraction, definitely one of, in the history of the US business, people would still explain to me why Hogan wouldn't be able to draw as champion. There were also political problems. Hogan was already a superstar with New Japan Pro Wrestling and made far more in Japan than in the AWA. At the same time, Ganya had a working arrangement with All Japan to send the AWA champion to that group for occasional title defenses. Hogan's 16-week-per-year New Japan scheduled was hard enough for the AWA to create so many fake injuries to him to work around, let alone be out having world title matches on that many house shows per year. But the fact Hogan wouldn't and couldn't work All Japan made it next to impossible for him to be champion except for a short-term fluke deal where he'd lose it right back. And the thought was a short reign would do more damage to him. See Tommy Rich than never getting it in the first place and remaining his elusive dangling carrot for his fans. But after he left the AWA and quickly won the WWF title, to most of the Midwestern fans, he, and not Bockwinkle was seen as the real world champion so it did hurt Bockwinkle's credibility as champion in the long run. Actually Flair had a similar problem. Flair and Hogan would work many of the same cities for rival groups at the beginning of that era's wrestling war. Hogan was the bigger draw in some cities and Flair in others when it all started. But Flair always did dusty finishes, leaving fans annoyed at the end of his matches, even though his matches were longer and far more dramatic. Hogan always won, at least in his climactic match, against everyone. While WWF had numerous other advantages in terms of exposure and the media and Hogan became a mainstream name and Flair really didn't at least at the time. As time went on, Hogan, kept strong in his programs, started out distancing Flair, who always was there to put other people over which was the job of the NWA champion stemming from the territorial days and wrestled so many grown finishes. Attendance records. Every time I see compilations of the largest gates I get irritated that Adnan El Kassi's matches in Baghdad aren't mentioned. Didn't he once wrestle a match promoted by Saddam Hussein against Andre the Giant where over 100,000 people attended? According to the Sheik, more than 50,000 people were turned away. Riots caused by fans trying to get to see the event saw six people die and the gate was supposedly more than $2 million. He also wrestled George Gordienko in a match that grossed over $1.2 million, as 65,000 attended. Are you aware of these events and can you fill in the graps? Adnan's records were all burned in a fire but there has to be some documentation somewhere. Ray Webb. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Response from Dave Meltzer, there are many stories of matches, such as Great Gama vs. Stanislaus Abishko in India or a Jim Lone Dose match in Greece that supposedly drew 100,000 fans, but there is no documentation that those figures aren't heavily exaggerated. For example, there was a match in Pakistan headlined by King Kong that supposedly drew 200,000 fans, as the number likely had been exaggerated as every year went by, but when someone actually saw a clip from the local newspaper, it was at that time only listed as 45,000 fans. That's why we don't include figures that aren't able to be documented. Tokyo Dome I don't see why so many people are bitching about the Tokyo Dome lineup. I think giving people the closest thing to a sure bet for match of the year would be enough of a draw. The match I would change would be to put Hiroshi Hase as Kenna Kobashi's partner in the match against Vader and Stan Hansen. I would also move Hayabusa out of the Baba match and into a higher-profile singles match. 
five years from now if Baba could get his gimmick off him, he could be his next big thing. Monthly FMW pay-per-view shows have some interesting possibilities depending on if they book the shows to where they build from one show to the next or they just go the ECW route and just throw everything out there. Hopefully Atsushi Onita won't book his match at on a stick matches and will allow his better talent to shine. Andy Stowell Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 